So, this evening, Lyra Hawkins. Lyra is an avid stargazer, taking both her name and study from the cosmos and the constellation that is her namesake. She moved to Aberystwyth in 2017, where she studied to become a Master of Astrophysics and has continued her study at Hull University as a PhD student. Lyra is working alongside the Kilo Degree Survey to examine the nature of our universe. As a self-described queer woman, she is passion passionate about outreach activities and wishes to help boost the representation of women and minority groups within academia and make it a place for everyone to enjoy learning. Outside of academia, Lyra, Lyra sorry, is a martial artist, a terror of terrible jokes, which we might have a few tonight, and an apprentice storyteller. When she's not studying the universe, she enjoys reading and telling tales of both mythology and folklore, a passion which has shaped her unique way of presenting. So please can everybody put their hands together and welcome Lyra Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Steve, for the lovely introduction. Um, so I have a I have a, a vague understanding of sort of the uh, the process of of these meetings. Um, so hopefully things will go well. Um, though that being said, technology and I do tend to uh, get on each other's nerves from time to time. Um, my uh, my plan is essentially just to run you through what I do, the research I do, um, and hopefully, if we have a bit of time, tell you a story um, of sort of how we came to be in the universe and what led up to it. And then at the end, I will be happy to answer any questions, um, go into more detail on anything. Um, I will admit I've spent the last week or two banging my head against very hard statistics, so uh, as something a little different, I thought to uh, step back a little and just uh, give you all an overview about uh, gravitational lensing and our universe. So um, I don't believe there's anything else. Steve introduced me wonderfully. Um, I guess I should say hello. So yes, um, my name is Lyra, as Steve said, and I take my name from the constellation Lyra, which is said to be the, the first ever lyre created by Hermes in the Greek mythology, or the lyre of Orpheus, um, which I thought was quite nice, considering I uh, I feel at times a bit of a bit of a muse, uh, and the universe itself does tend to give me quite a bit of inspiration. Um, inspiration, actually, as it stands for my research, which is exploring the universe through gravitational lensing. So I'd like to start off by talking to you all about gravity. Now, gravity is a really common effect that we see in our day to day lives, um, just pulls things towards other things, or at least that's what was believed for the longest time, especially during the time of Isaac Newton and the rest of the world. However, there are some things that Newtonian gravity couldn't really fully explain. Now, if you know the laws of gravity, it should be fairly possible to predict with high accuracy the actions of every orbiting star, galaxy, planet and asteroid throughout the universe, if you know its starting conditions. But there are some things that Newtonian gravity couldn't explain. And one of the most fascinating of these effects, in my opinion, is what's known as the precession of Mercury. Now, there's a little gif in the bottom left and the bottom right hand corner, rather, that's showing the, uh, the difference in the orbit of Mercury around our sun in Newtonian forms and what is later known as by Einstein general relativity. And you can see that the furthest point and the closest point to the sun uh, in Mercury's orbit shift slightly under the theory of general relativity. Whereas according to Newton's theory, this was not supposed to happen. And yet it does happen. So I'd like to talk to you all a bit about why this happens to help you understand the nature of our universe and how we come about gravitational lensing in particular. So let's let's enter Einstein, uh, a genius who, in my opinion, probably doesn't need any introduction. Um, 
Einstein believed that gravity wasn't quite a force that pulled one object to another, like an apple falling down from the tree onto the earth. But in fact, was the effect seen when very massive objects, very huge, large, heavy, dense objects bent the fabric of space that they resided in? So let's imagine space as a piece of stretched out fabric. Now, if we place a heavy object on that fabric, like a bowling ball, for example, it will bend and it will curve under the weight of the ball. And the heavier the object we put on there, the greater the bend will be. If we put a marble on there, it'll be fairly small. If we put a cannonball on that, we'll have quite a large bend. And this is the principle that lies within general relativity. And like a marble rolling around the edge of a bowl or perhaps one of those coins that you see going around the edge of a, a supermarket uh, drain game, um, the orbits of our planets are kept stable because their orbital speed matches the infalling force of gravity. So every planet is kept in a, a very precarious sort of dance, as you would uh, call it, between falling down into the sun and actually breaking free and escaping off into space. And it's the balance of these two forces that keeps everything in orbit. And this same principle can be extended out to stars orbiting a galaxy or a black hole or asteroids orbiting a, a small star, for example. This, this principle, we believe at least, applies on all scales. So if we imagine gravity like this, then we understand that it can actually affect any object in the universe, regardless of its size, weight, or even mass, um, including, as it would be called, light. So light, from our understanding of gravity then, or rather what we were taught from a young age. Let's start at the beginning. We, we're taught that light always follows the shortest path between two points that is usually a straight line. But this isn't always true. On much larger scales, what we see actually is that light follows the bends and the curves of space uh, in this fabric from our analogy just, yeah. which can be a rather difficult concept to grasp. So I'd like to pass on to you an analogy that my physics teacher gave me um, when I was just starting university that I thought helped a lot. Um, and that is that we as people are stuck to the Earth's ground. And no matter where we walk to, we will always remain on the surface. Ah, yes, the Earth. So we're walking around the Earth. If we decide to walk in a straight line, eventually we will come back and reach the point where we started at. Um, did we actually travel in a straight line? Well, the answer to that is more a matter of perspective than anything else. From our point of view, we've walked in a straight line and we've not turned or bent or curved at all. And yet we've returned back to where we began. But from somebody watching us keenly from uh, the far distance of space, perhaps, it would look like we've walked in a perfect circle around the outside of our planet. So in a very similar way to which we are bound to Earth, rays of light in the universe are actually bent and have to follow and are bound to the space they travel through. So what might be a straight line for the ray of light from our perspective instead looks like a curve or a bend, which is absolutely fascinating, I believe. And this is what we astronomers can use, um, myself, yourself, and all the other astronomers looking out into the night sky themselves. This is the principle behind gravitational lensing. So, we know that mass can bend space and by extension, mass can bend light. So if we work out the amount of this bend, the deflection angle, we can calculate the mass of very distant objects. And this is the principle of gravitational lensing. I'm going to see if I can change my slide. There we go. So we've clarified that massive objects can bend light and act as lenses, but how does this actually lead to us measuring it? Well, when we detect what we call a lens source, what we're actually seeing is a virtual image in space. We're seeing a projection almost of what we think it, this uh, object looks like in a position straight from us, which is shown in this diagram here. The images we see are at the ends of these dotted lines when in actuality, the object itself is in a much different location. Now, some tests can be done to determine how far away this is from us, this object, like calculating its redshift, which I can go into later. And through the use of numerous mathematical calculations, we can find out the angle of the deflection um, 
and how far the light rays have been altered on their path. So the limits of this, uh, how heavy do you have to be to lend something? Do you have to be the size of a person, perhaps? A planet, a black hole, even larger? Well, technically, anything that have, has mass will bend space a little bit. But for anything really less in size than a large star, this effect is almost unnoticeable. So what we need to be looking for, we need to be looking for extremely dense objects out in space, clusters of galaxies, galaxies, black holes, very large stars. These are all types of astronomical objects that we can detect a lensing signal around. So the simplest types tend to occur around large objects with a lot of concentrated mass in the center of the lens. So some of you may be wondering why at the beginning I specified weak lensing in my title and by extension maybe perhaps there's a strong lensing. And I've just got a little diagram to show you here of what strong lensing might look like. This is a small simulation of a black hole passing in front of a background galaxy and you can see that as the image starts to approach the black hole, the light is distorted around it and forms this ring. And this is a case of what strong lensing would be. So strong lensing. Strong lensing is defined by any, any lensing effect where you can see multiple images, arcs in your image, or in some very special cases, a ring around the outside of your lens. And this ring is a very special case, as you can see in the top right. This is an image from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey of the most complete Einstein ring that we've ever seen. So what you can see in the GIF in the bottom right hand corner now um, is this case of strong lensing or strong gravitational lensing. And if multiple images of the same source are produced by this lens, we can categorize it as strong lensing. And this can actually be done. You can look out into the sky and see this, or you can do this experiment at home as well with a wine glass. If anybody has a wine glass to hand, if you tilt the base of the wine glass towards a light or towards a candle or some sort of source, you can see that the light from that source will be warped and distorted and you'll see either arcs, multiple images, or if you look dead center through the base of the glass, you will see it form a near perfect ring around the base. And this is the same principle as what we see out in space. So by comparison, weak lensing. The iconic arcs and rings are all typical cases of what we would call strong lensing. So what would weak lensing actually look like? Well, weak lensing is really, really difficult to detect. Um, so difficult, in fact, that you can't observe it directly with your eyes like we can with strong lensing. What we need to do instead is compare multiple weakly lensed galaxies in an image together and try and detect the very faint alignments around them. <coughs> So weak lensing has two main components to it, what we call convergence and shear. Now, these are fairly simple. They're just given complicated names because we astronomers like to overly complicate things. Convergence is just the effect that magnifies an image, makes it bigger or smaller, depending on the distortion. And the shear will distort the shape, which means it could make a circular galaxy look elliptical um, or even change the shape of an already elliptical galaxy and shift it slightly. Um, what you can see in the images to the side is just a very overly exaggerated type of weak lensing. But just to give you an idea of what the kind of things we're searching for are. The problem in this arises, however, is that we don't fully know what the original shape of the galaxy is. We can only see the images that we receive from Earth. So what we need to do is we need to compare all of the galaxies in the lensing sample that we have together and see if we can detect any small similarities or alignments in their shape because light that's taken the same path will have a similar looking distortion. So of the types of weak lensing that we have, there are a couple, but two of important note that we use a lot. The first is called galaxy-galaxy lensing or GGL. And galaxy-galaxy lensing occurs when there's a, a galaxy in your foreground that acts as the lens for a background source. Now this background source is usually another galaxy. And from this, we make an approximation that we call the thin lens approximation. And the thin lens approximation is the same approximation made when we make glasses, for example, for those that are hard of sight, for example. And the assumption there is that the distance between the observer, us, and the source, uh, be it the background galaxy or something else, 
is so large that the width of the galaxy or the lens by comparison is negligible. It's practically zero, so we can just ignore it. And this is a really important assumption that helps us with our mathematical equations that allow us to determine the angle of deflection. The other important form of weak lensing is what we call large scale structure lensing or LSS lensing. And in this instance, the actual scaffolding itself of the universe is the lens for very distant sources. Now, because of the size of this, the thin lens approximation doesn't uh, apply, but we have other forms of mathematical magic, essentially, that we can use to, uh, to work out the lensing signal. However, what makes the large scale structure lensing even more difficult to detect is that the effects are incredibly subtle. If you think of um, standard strong lensing forming a huge arc, for example, or bending the shape of a galaxy around in a ring, by comparison, the large scale structure only alters the shape by about 0.1 to 1%. It's minuscule by comparison and is very difficult to detect. So how can we use weak lensing to observe the universe? What, what do we actually use it for? Well, weak lensing, um, the measurements we take have many different uses, but most of them pertain to actually measure, measuring the mass of astronomical objects out in space. And from these measurements, we can see what the distribution of the mass is within the lens, what the overall total mass is, um, and a few other bits, but these two are the key ones for now. Now, you may realize that what we can't do is tell the type of mass. We can't say, this is lensed by a sun, or this is lensed by um, a nebula of dust, for example. We only know the, the overall mass, and this has its drawbacks as well as its as well as its as well as its benefits. My God, sorry. Um, so, it could be that what we're measuring is regular matter from stars, planets, and dust, or it could also be the elusive dark matter, and this is where gravitational lensing really comes into its own. So what you can see here is a beautiful, beautiful picture of the bullet cluster. And the bullet cluster is a really unique example where we are seeing two clusters that are actually colliding. And we've superimposed a few images over the top of the visible light one here. The pinkish, um, the pinkish color is the intensity of the light we've received in the X-ray spectrum from sources. And these usually denote things like black holes, pulsars, quasars, your regular large stars, these, this baryonic, this regular matter is seen here. But the blue cloud shows us the intensity of the gravitational, or the mass rather, from detected from gravitational lensing. And you can see that there's a disconnect between the two. The majority of the mass isn't where the majority of the light we can see is coming from. In fact, there's something invisible out there that we can't see directly, but we can measure its effects. And this is one of the biggest, well, the, one of the thoughts of the biggest um, ideas behind the concept of dark matter. And it's actually in this way that we detect all of the dark matter that we know. We don't see it per se, but we can measure its effects on other things around it. So this picture was not perhaps created by very big spiders. It's an image of our cosmic web from the Eagle Project. So if we take a step back now and look at the wider universe and the culmination of what gravitational lensing measurements can help us to see, we can look out into the universe and see clusters of galaxies strung out in the sky. And by measuring the distance and the amount of mass in them, we can start to get an understanding of their position in the universe. And we get a really curious picture. What we see in fact is a vast web of countless galaxies out there in the universe, stretching out across the universe. And in a similar manner to our bullet cluster diagram from the previous slide, we've highlighted here in red the luminous matter that we can see from X-ray observables and gamma-ray observables. But in green, we've got what we predict to be dark matter. And this is the mass we've detected through weak gravitational lensing. And you can see they line up and make this web and the luminous matter follows this dark matter in its structure. Now, to reach this point, countless measurements have been made by survey teams across the globe using all current theories to map out and predict what our universe looks like. But of these theories now and applications, weak lensing is a critical tool that can show us where the matter in the universe lies and how it's distributed. And from this, then, we can begin to understand 
how the cosmos has come to be as it is. So I mentioned just uh, the current theory, shall we say, um, how we believe cosmology is unfolding. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Lambda CDM model. Um, Lambda is that upside down looking V symbol. It's a, a Greek letter. Um, and the Lambda CDM model is considered to be the standard model just because um, most people believe that it works ubiquitously across the universe. And the errors that we've run into it with it so far have not been too critical. So to break it down, flat, uh, in this instance, refers to the shape of our universe. Where walking across the Earth would bring us back to the same point, a flat universe is an infinite plane. That means you could walk in a direction and never return to the point where you've been. It is completely flat. Lambda, that upside down V, is what we call a cosmological constant. It's uh, associated with dark energy, which we believe to make up around 70% of the universe. And CDM just refers to cold, dark matter. Dark matter, as we already know, is this mysterious um, matter that we can't see through light interactions. And cold just means that we believe this dark matter moves more slowly than the speed of light. There are other theories out there, hot dark matter, for example, uh, Lambda HDM, but um, Lambda CDM is what most people believe currently is the winning theory as it is. And this theory is incredibly useful. Um, and it's proven itself on multiple occasions. It predicts things like the existence of our cosmic microwave background radiation, which I'll go into in a bit. Uh, it predicts the existence of our large scale structure. It even predicts the abundances of elements throughout the universe that we think should exist out there. And in later, in remote, more recent years rather, have actually seen things like hydrogen, helium and lithium that we expect to be really common in our universe are all predicted by this model. Now, distant measurement, distance measurements in the uh, gal galactic clusters throughout the universe suggest that the latter half of the universe's life has been dominated by an accelerating force, an expansion. Um, you've probably all heard that the universe is expanding and expanding and accelerating. And we attribute this to what we call dark energy, which is the driving force behind this cosmological expansion. Now, a popular theory at the moment is that this dark energy might be something called vacuum energy, which states that the vast expanse of space is filled with um, virtual or imaginary particles that can pop into existence and disappear again. It's what they call a potential energy, something that has the potential to exist. Um, and this energy is what we then consider to be the, the foundations for dark energy. But measurements of that at the moment have put our dark energy parameters around 60 times less than what quantum physics predicts. So the search keeps going on and we still do not know a lot about dark energy. So we're about halfway through. I just want to recap on what we've sort of processed in this first sort of half of my talk. Um, and I, then I'd like to take you on a bit of a brief journey back to the very beginning of our universe to give you an idea of how everything came to be. So we know that thanks to Einstein and some of the great physicists of the 20th century, um, that gravity is the effect of matter falling down the curve in space and that more massive objects will create a steeper curve. We know that light will travel along this curve on its journey and can be seen as bending as it travels from one point of the universe to the other. And this is the foundation of gravitational lensing. And we know that this gravitational lensing can reveal the existence of dark or unseen matter throughout the universe. So I'd like to just do a little thought with you all that's a bit fun. Considering that the speed of light is not infinite, it takes time from light to travel from one place to the, to the next. It takes about eight minutes from light to travel from our sun to our eyes. So we're technically seeing light that was emitted eight minutes ago. So if we increase this distance to, let's say, oh, I don't know, a thousand light years, something immeasurably huge, okay? That means that the time it takes light to travel from the source to our eyes is 1,000 years. So what we're actually observing is the state of that source from 1,000 years in the past. So by looking deeper and deeper into the universe, we can actually get an idea of how the universe has evolved over time, which is absolutely crucial to understanding how it's evolved and how it's grown and the structure now that we see today. And by combining all of these tests and these models, we can start to create a model that predicts how the universe evolves over time from its very conception right up to the present day. There are still some things we haven't answered, however. 
Like, what is dark matter? Why is there a giant web connecting our cosmos together? Is it really not giant spiders? I can promise you it isn't. Um, so to answer some of that, I'm going to need to take you all back now, back 13.8 billion years into the past, so the very moment that the universe was born. So, as one of my favourite authors says, first there was nothing, which then exploded. Um, and I'm sure you all out there have heard um, big things come in small packages, or as my parents were very fond of telling me, you know, all good things start with a bang. And that's no more true than it is in the case of our universe. In 1927, George Lamartre proposed that the universe started from a single point in space with a colossal explosion. And in that explosion, incredible amounts of energy were generated and spread out through the known universe. This is what we call the Big Bang model. So using the laws of physics as we know, we can then follow this through and predict what the universe looked like in its infancy, which would have been an extremely dense and concentrated point filled with unfathomable amounts of energy, which suddenly burst forth. And we can separate this out into four very nice stages. The very early universe, the early universe, the dark ages, and the universe today. I'm gonna to touch on the first three, and I apologize for the naming of them, I'm, uh, astronomers are not the most creative of people, but we do like to make things awkward. So let's talk about the very early universe for a bit. <clears throat> the very early universe was over in a flash, literally in a flash. It lasted for one million millionth of a second or a picosecond. And during this time, there was no time, there was no space, and the laws of physics probably didn't apply because before this, we assumed there was nothing. So something had to be created for this nothing to expand into. And there had to be a time frame for which this nothing could expand by. So first, time and space, we believe, were both created. After this, the four fundamental forces came to be, gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces that keep all of our atoms in our body together. And still during this time, the universe was full of energy, but there were tiny little ripples within this energy. And these tiny little ripples are incredibly important because these are going to become the foundations of what we see today. So after that first picosecond, the early universe took over. And within one second, our quarks are combined into protons and neutrons, the sort of subatomic particles that make up all of our atoms. And then after a couple minutes, we start to see the very first elements coming out, hydrogen and helium in very much similar conditions to that we see in the centre of our sun and stars. Nuclear fusion was occurring, bringing, bringing subatomic particles together into the very first atoms. And by about 20 minutes now, the universe had cooled down enough that these particles can't really form elements, but what they can do is they can start to form molecules. And this is the state for about 100,000 years now. The universe, hyped up with its very early rush of energy, is now going to relax for a little bit. Um, and over these 100,000 years, we see this first molecules coming to be as the universe begins to relax a bit. Helium and hydride being a mix of one helium and one hydrogen. And this goes on with um, particles coming together, floating apart until the universe moves into its next phase, 370,000 years after the Big Bang first occurred. And this moment, this moment when the universe goes from the early universe to the dark ages is known as the point of recombination. And the reason for this is before this time, the universe was still opaque. Light could not travel outside of this shell of gas. It was too thick, too hot, too dense. But at the point that it became visible, transparent, the light that burst forth stayed as it will do now for the rest of time. And we can see this. This light has filled our universe now, and it's what we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's the radiation left over from this point of recombination. And if any of you have owned or still own an old, um, I believe they're called photon TVs, uh, the ones that when you turn them on, you get the lovely black and white crackle that entertained me as a child for the longest time. That is the cosmic microwave background radiation. That is the aerial on your TV picking up that radiation and trying to make sense of it and turning it into an image, which I think is fascinating. 
Now you can see this image in the bottom right hand corner. Um, this shows a sort of heat map of the fluctuations. Now we think the universe at the start was pretty much uniform. It was the same from start to finish, but it wasn't exactly. And what you can see here from the red to the blue is about three to the minus six ish uh, degrees. That's 0 0.000003 of a degree from one side to the next. It's an incredibly small change, but again, these changes are incredibly important because where these areas are of bright red are, the gas is hotter, it's more concentrated, there's more in there rushing around. And where these bluer areas are, it's more relaxed, there's less there, it's more spacious, and um, the gas there is cooler. And it's at this point we enter the Dark Ages, which during the Dark Ages, not a lot happens for a long period of time. This is the point when the very first stars start to form, around two to five hundred million years after the Big Bang. The first stars, the first galaxies come together. We're not 100% certain of the exact time because these stars would have been massive, filled with near pure hydrogen. And these kind of stars are the very like live fast, die young kind, uh, exploding out into gigantic supernovas, forming huge black holes that are probably at the centers of our galaxies now. Uh, and seeding the universe with the elements of life. Iron, lithium, carbon, oxygen, everything that we see now started at this point, created in supernovas just like these that have started to scatter the gas out throughout the universe. And for the rest of the Dark Ages, these stars tend to evolve slowly, um, forming galaxies, forming clusters of galaxies, which start to come forwards into our giant web. But why still, why is it a web? Well, if we go back again to the era uh, of recombination, when the universe was still opaque, there were tiny little ripples within our universe, as we mentioned, created by various patches of very dense or under dense space. Now, these heavy, dense patches began to collapse in under the force of gravity, which heated up the local region around it and produced radiation. It produced light and heat in the form of um, thermal radiation, uh, infrared rays, for example. And these infrared rays have a pressure and they pushed out the surrounding gas, which cooled down. And once they've cooled sufficiently, the gas would collapse back in on itself and it would expand and it would contract and it would expand and it would contract in something that we call baryonic acoustic oscillations. Baryonic being the type of matter, helium, hydrogen. The acoustic oscillations refer to these acted in a very similar way, we think, to how sound, wave, sound waves move. They have areas of dense where the atoms are squished together, and they have under dense areas where the atoms are spread out apart. So at this point of recombination, when these waves were frozen in space at this point, they stopped moving. Then these dense areas are going to get denser because of the, the force of gravity. And these less dense areas are going to start to drift apart because of um, the well, what we would call the inverse pressure curve of it, being that they were not heavy enough, they were not dense enough to attract more gas in. So over time, they've had their, their matter pulled away from them to form these giant large voids. And this then is the fundamental basis. This is the, the, the structure, the scaffolding for which our cosmic web was built on. Now, what I have here is just a small little um, simulation of how our universe may have evolved from a big gaseous cloud into the type of web that we would see today. And I'm just going to play it for you. So what we can see as we look through is uh, these heavy patches of gas start to come together. They're falling in on each other, pulling matter away from other areas, and they start to form these long, thin threads. And you can see around this time now that you see small sparks of light come out. And these are, are stars bursting into existence. There are supernovas like the one that's just exploding in the center of the screen there. And you can see now these galaxies starting to form as the red matter falls in on itself, getting tighter and tighter, forming out these long, thin threads, creating the voids in between them as we start to approach the present day. And this, this 
cosmic web is the culmination of multiple surveys worth of work, of gravitational lensing, of studying the cosmic microwave background radiation, of all these surveys looking at light and other such matters throughout the universe end in our understanding now of the universe, which looks something like this. So what, what is it that I am actually doing? Um, because I'd like to tell you all a bit about myself as well. Um, I'm currently uh, working on compressing data because to get accurate measurements of this, we need to study millions and millions of different points of data of galaxies in the sky. We have to measure their shapes and compare them with each other. And for this, extremely large data sets are needed, which poses a problem because this is going to take time and working out the individual correlations between them is extremely complicated. Pardon me. So this is one of the current problems that we're having with studying gravitational lensing at the moment that I'm actually working on myself. Another is that early universe studies still disagree with late universe studies. Studying the cosmic microwave background radiation and studying the cosmic web at this point in our local late universe don't fully line up yet. Some astronomers have different opinions on perhaps what is happening, the value of some of our constants, for example. We think different numbers um, are the root constant, and we're still disagreeing. There's, there's a bit of tension between people in the astronomical community at the moment. And there's still so much we don't know. How big are these filaments? What's the true nature of dark matter? Does it exist? Or is it purely that maybe our understanding of gravity is completely wrong and we need to change it? Are there huge, massive particles that we call WIMPs, for example, um, or axions? And what actually is this dark energy? Where does it come from? Why is it expanding our universe faster now than it has ever done before? And I hope that in the not so distant future, these are the types of things that we will get to answer and explore, not just myself, but uh, astronomers throughout the community and even um, amateur astronomy societies like yourselves. So um, I'd like to stop there and thank you all for listening. If anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to go through them now. Um, yeah, I'd like to open the floor up. Feel free to raise a hand or stick a message in the chat. Okay, thank you, Lyra. Uh, could I ask you to stop sharing your screen? Of course. And then uh, we can see uh, the usual suspects. <laughs> and uh, as always, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, digital hand, preferably, uh, and people in the room will give me a wave. I think uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker Roy Gunson wants to ask a question. Uh, on the uh, computer modeling of the uh, formation of the sort of the web, are there any predictions going forward? You know, we've, we've done 13.8 million years, but what about 26 and million years? I, it's, right? a, it's a fascinating question. There is, um, There were three theories at the turn of the 21st century um, that were called, uh, I believe, the Big Crunch. Um, the big gasp, and there was a third one whose name eludes me, but essentially the theories were that the universe would reach a critical point where it would start to fall back in and expand in on its own, uh, contract in on itself until we had another big bang and everything would come back and forwards in that sort of bouncing fashion for eternity. The, there was a second form that believed the universe would reach a critical point and stop. And then the third, which is seeming to be most likely for us now, is that the universe will expand and this expansion will accelerate and accelerate and accelerate and accelerate ad infinitum. And that's what we believe is going to be happening for the time being, unless something changes or some new discovery is made. So these filaments are going to stretch out even further. The spaces between them are going to get larger and larger and larger um, up until a point really where the universe is stretched out over infinity. And perhaps then it's a dark and empty universe which is a rather existential thought, unfortunately, but I wouldn't worry because that's going to be happening billions of years in the future. So we don't need to worry about that for now. I was hearing that the, they were talking about the dark energy was increasing so that eventually it, it would even split, up, split apart quarks in, in the, uh, you know, proton and neutron. So particles would sort of fly apart. 
You yeah, know? absolutely. They're, 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 they're believing that this acceleration is going to keep on increasing and increasing um, to the point where perhaps like galaxies are flying away from each other so quickly that stars are pulled from their orbit and the very uh, forces that keep everything together and keep things running actually begin to break down. And already we can see that dark energy is greater than the effects of gravity on large scales. Um, because this universe is still expanding. The, the mass within our universe is not great enough to keep itself in anymore. And the universe is reaching out into these new unknowns because of this accelerating factor of dark energy. Okay, Roy. Um, questions? Anybody in the room? Whilst you're all thinking, I've got one for you. I'm going right back to, to the other side of the time scale. <coughs> Absolutely. About you talk about recombination happening some 370,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, is there any possibility of actually seeing, and I'm saying seeing in inverted commas, having some sort of signal to look at beyond that time limit? So it's a very um, it's a very complicated one to try and um, to try and view in that sort of manner of seeing and detecting it because prior to this time the universe was completely opaque um, you couldn't see into it um, so if you imagine perhaps um, a balloon for example and we're filling it up with all this gas and this energy and at the point of recombination it pops and at that point you can see whatever was inside. But prior to that, we're trying to look in <clears throat> through what is an opaque surface. So as far as I'm aware, it's not currently possible. Now, there may be tests that we can make, but what we do know instead is what was going on inside by the signal that we've received from this cosmic microwave background radiation, because that is a snapshot image of whatever was happening at the precise moment of recombination. So we use that then to try and extrapolate back and use our models and what we understand with physics to actually predict what was happening beforehand. But observing it physically, I, as far as I'm aware, there's been no strides into passing that limit, unfortunately. I understand your argument. Uh, one of the things, or, yeah, I understand your argument. But one of the things that I would say was, but surely we're, we're actually observing the universe from within that explosion. So it's not like we're looking outside its balloon. We're actually in the balloon. Absolutely. But the problem is, is that when we're looking back now, um, you've got to think that things have changed so dramatically and drastically since that early period that the one thing that's been kept sort of constant since that time is this flash of radiation, this flash of light. Um, and anything that came before that, due to the amount of time that this light will have been traveling forwards, a phenomenon known called redshift occurs, which is where um, light is shifted towards the redder end of the spectrum, the further it's traveled. Uh, we can use this to detect very, very distant objects and categorize them as stars because they will have the same sort of emission lines, but they will be redder than we would expect. Um, and the furthest we can go so far is microwaves. And this is sort of the limit of what we can detect. Anything else is going to be so faint, so um, dispersed and so low in energy that we're not actually able to detect it at the moment. Perhaps there will be a breakthrough, um, but currently, as far as I'm aware, there isn't one. But it would definitely be an interesting thing to look into. OK, thank you. It's obvious I have to spend more time in a darkened room yeah. thinking about these things. I uh, spend far too long in a darkened room. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter Lloyd from Doncaster Astronomical Society. Peter? Thank you, Paul. Uh, hello, Lyle. Thank you very much. A super talk uh, that leaves an awful lot to think about. I, oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm probably asking you to explain very simply something that isn't simple at all. But going right back to your description of weak gravitational lensing, I think you said you're looking for these tiny changes in the appearance of a distant galaxy. And I'm wondering how you can possibly detect that when you don't know what the galaxy looks like in the first place. Oh, well, um, this, this has been a big problem with my, um, my research. Um, when we 
when we take these observations, what we can do is we can perform something called a two-point correlation analysis, where we look at two different points in the sky uh, and we sort of connect them and we say, well, are these two points correlated at all? Is there any similarity between them? Um, because we know that an Einstein ring will form around the outside of this, um, this lens. So we know that all of the little galaxies around it should all be orientated so that they sort of are perpendicular to the center of the lens. That is, a right angle can be drawn from the center of the lens to the middle of that galaxy. So for, for weak lensing, where only one image is provided, we can sort of detect this, this slight shift in alignment based on correlations between different galaxies around the outside of this lens. But a big problem that exists is what we call the intrinsic alignment um, problem that has to be modeled. You see, galaxies can, we don't know the inherent alignment of these galaxies. Um, there are many different things. They are randomly scattered out across the universe. So it's usually a fair assumption to say that if we average over every galaxy, what we should see is a circle, a perfect average, which there's, there's a bit of an error on this that's intrinsic to all weak gravitational lensing measurements, but it's usually quite good to say that if we assume there's a circle and that we measure the alignment between two random galaxies, we can start to see what the, um, what the lensing signal might look like. We have to use thousands and millions of galactic pairs to do this because the more we use, the more reliable it gets. But there are types of effects that can actually uh, bias this um, which we call intrinsic alignments. For example, two galaxies within uh, a cluster can be aligned based on the gravitational interactions between them. And there can also be uh, alignments based on a background galaxy with a foreground galaxy as the light from the background moves through a dark matter halo and is actually shifted and contorted to look similar to the foreground galaxy. So these are all problems that then arise in the detection of this weak lensing signal that have to be extensively modeled and we need to use things called um, these two-point correlation functions. We need to measure ellipticity uh, and all other manner of things to get this accurate signal. But no, you're right, it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do and uh, was only really uh, postulated in the late 1900s and we've only managed to do it in sort of the last 30, 40 years, I believe. Well, thank you. I, I see now why you have this huge data set that you're now working on. Yeah, uh, there's, and, um, there's, oh, sorry. Well, I was only going to say, I, I, I then wonder how on earth enough telescope time is found to gather all this information. Well, absolutely. What we can do is we can take snapshots and then analyze those snapshots at a later date. Um, what I can potentially do is if I can share my screen once more with you. I did prepare a few extra slides just in case of uh, questions like this. So one thing I manage with a lot is a mathematical concept called a covariance matrix, um, right. which I've drawn on my sort of home whiteboard just to the side. And what you see is along the diet, this shows the um, the change or the difference between two different parameters. And on the diagonal, you have how a parameter changes with its with respect to itself or the variance. And you generate matrices like these that are hundreds and hundreds wide and hundreds and hundreds long as well. Um, so you can start to see that sort of the order of magnitude we're looking at. And by comparing all of these with one another, you can start to see then the, um, the alignment between them. So for example, you can be comparing uh, beta and gamma, gamma and delta, and so forth and so forth. Um, and it's these covariance matrices that make it so difficult to actually model large amounts of data sets because the bigger the covariance matrix, the more complicated it is to, to actually work it out, which is where this data compression then comes into its sort of, its, its golden hour, as you would. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, I, I have come across covariance somewhere in my long history. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um... it's a familiar word. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. No Thank you, Peter. Just a, a quick follow up question uh, then to Peter's. Um, and that is, um, is, is there any chance of double counting a galaxy in a survey through uh, lensing? So that, there is. Um, 
as, as not all lenses are perfectly separated out into weak and strong. You will have, um, for example, strong lenses that have weakly lensed objects around the outside or weak lenses that have some strongly lensed things in there. Uh, and separating them out can be very difficult. So what we can do is we can separate our sources out into what we call tomographic bins. So if you imagine space as a long line, um, we can split this line up into what they call epochs or sort of periods of time. So we can say that anything within point A to B is in the last 1000 years. It's a thousand light years away. Point B to C is 2000 light years and so on and so on and so on. And you can categorize these then by the redshift of the light. So light within this sort of this region of the visible spectrum or this region of the infrared spectrum comes from this specific time zone. And doing this, then you can start to detect multiple images that might be coming forth because you'll know roughly sort of how many galaxies you should assume to see within each epoch at that point. Um, and of course, strongly lensed objects are much easier to detect with them being uh, much greater sort of contorted effects in the distortion of their shape. Uh, and other such man, uh, things. But thankfully, we have computers now, so we don't have to do it by eye, which is wonderful. Um, and what we can do is we can just sort of scan the pixels across to top to bottom throughout an image uh, and then build up sort of an array of data from those images uh, and process that through, which reduces the sort of human error that comes into uh, play by counting. I think my supervisor's supervisor did do some things on looking at lensing via um, via the eye, and honestly, I'm amazed at his precision and sort of care that he took when analysing these images because it was astounding to see. But it's it's definitely a problem, but one that we are mitigating with uh, computational uh, acts within it. Okay, thank you. Uh, over to our one of our Spanish correspondents, uh, Andy Davy. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Hi, Lyra. Thank you for a brilliant talk. I really enjoyed it. Buenas um, noches. <laughs> muchísimas gracias. Um, my question is, I've got a lot of interest in the early universe and is the Big Bang theory and the universe theory. Now, so, some of the problems with that, and one in particular is how, how, how inflation stopped. But is there any mainstream doing any serious thought into whether the Big Bang could have occurred in an earlier universe. And if it did, some of the difficult problems with the universe theory, would that help make them maybe a bit easier? Potentially. Um, it's a very difficult thing to, to sort of uh, go by because uh, one of uh, sort of Newton's famous like laws is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Now, um, what we can assume is that all energy is a form of information. Um, from this light, you can see how far, like how old it is or what its wavelength is. This can tell us things. So we can assume that every photon of light is a small packet of information. Now, the problem is, is that in the very, very early universe, in the moment the Big Bang occurred, none of the laws of physics as we know apply. So it's very much like taking a whiteboard of whatever was beforehand rubbing it off with a rubber, completely cleaning it and starting again from scratch with this Big Bang. So it's, it's a point where sort of all of the information in the universe has been wiped clean. And at that point, there's no way of really knowing what came beforehand, um, only what came after. And there's this problem that, again, we can only sort of theorise what happened in the 370,000 years afterwards uh, using various models. So. It could be that our universe is the bounce back from an old universe that collapsed in on collapsed in on itself, or something else occurred beforehand. But with technology and physics as it is at the moment, we don't have the telescope sizes or the missions planned to really do any more than just theorize. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't like the idea that sort of something started from nothing. That doesn't sit very well with me. So. Um, I can only assume that something was there beforehand that created this roaring explosion, perhaps something not where it should have been, or perhaps there's other dimensions, but we're starting to lead into like science fiction, which um, 
probably won't get you uh, a lot of brownie points from the scientific community if you post a paper regarding science fiction. Um, there's definitely papers out there, but for more information on the early universe, um, there's a survey called the Planck Survey, which I'll put in the chat for anyone to look at if they want. Uh, and this survey was uh, essentially examining the cosmic microwave background radiation um, to study the early universe. And it might be a nice place for you to go on if you want to read more on that sort of era. But anything that talks about cosmology is always a great start as well. Mm. I hope you. that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's, okay. there's, no, there's nothing stops us doing any what I call free thinking, is it? Absolutely. It's a good exercise, if nothing else. OK, thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm just going to take two more questions, one from uh, Mike. Um, and he just wants me to pass on this question. Does the mass gravity involved in lensing affect redshift, i.e. could light get a gravitational assist and the redshift therefore be less? So there's not a case of this occurring for redshift. Um, it, it's a very it's a very difficult sort of uh, thing to answer because there's a lot going into it, you see. Now, if you imagine um, our sort of our, our space fabric, once again, light traveling into our, our galaxy is going to be falling down this sort of gravitational potential hill almost as it comes down. And like going down a hill on, uh, on a skateboard or a set of wheels, you're going to pick up speed as you go. And this is the, this is true for light as well is um, it will sort of speed up slightly as it enters our galaxy which shifts the redshift a little bit but all light is suffering the same thing and if you assume that as it sort of enters the gravitational well of a lensing galaxy it also has to leave it at the same time and this curve is equal on both sides so you'll see it roughly cancels itself out and any sort of um issue with the actual redshift itself is somewhat negligible. The bigger concern comes is when we're actually measuring these photometric, photometric redshifts, and that's redshift via uh, photometry or light. Um, and that's actually the, the tools we use have an error rate on them that is intrinsic based on how they're built. There are distorting effects due to, say, the shape of the telescope. Uh, you have to keep the cores of them at like three Kelvin. It's, it has to be incredibly cold. Otherwise, you get infrared radiation leaking in and spoiling your results. And these errors actually constitute more than you would see via physical effects. What does occur, however, is something called the sunyev zeldovich effect or the SZ effect. Uh, and this occurs when um, a highly charged photon collides with something like a proton or an electron or a neutron and passes off a bit of its energy to it and so loses that energy. Uh, and the same can happen in the inverse, where a highly charged electron can bump into a, pro into a photon and give it a bit of a boost of energy. So when we're looking at our uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMBR, we actually can detect spots that might be slightly warmer than they should be due to this SZ effect. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, any effects of gravity altering redshift are inconsequential in comparison to the other problems we have to face with uh, technology, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. And uh, <coughs> Tony Morris. Hi, Lyra. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. I've got you loud and clear. Uh, good. Uh, the recombination era, when uh, the universe is opaque to light, what were the neutrinos doing then? It's an incredible question. What neutrinos usually tend to do, which is mostly whiz around everywhere, carrying small amounts of energy with them, bumping into things and setting off chain reactions, generally being a nuisance, from what I'm aware, at least. Um, neutrinos, as I'm sure you know, are sort of the byproduct of nuclear fission. Um, when um, atoms combine, you get a small neutrino that comes out at the end that sort of sparks up and it can join in with another one and spark off um, a fusion or a fission effect there and these neutrinos tend to be fairly in in, uninteractive they don't tend to um, interact with much on the form of light or gravity um, so they're very difficult to detect um, is the problem and most of them have been either recaptured and re-emitted in other sort of um, 
in other collisions and the like, um, as far as I'm aware, at least. Uh, particle physics isn't quite my area, but from my current understanding of the neutrino physics is that at this point of recombination, because the early universe can be considered to be a very like hot soup almost, um, it was a plasma, which is a gas that gets so warm that it acts like a liquid. These neutrinos were just essentially swimming around in it and boosting off combination effects, um, creating new uh, atoms throughout the uh, throughout that period of 3,700 years. But were they actually leaking out, so to speak? So I don't believe they were leaking out off the top of my head. Um, I've not done a lot of work into it, but because of the inherent heat of that early universe, there were there were so many photons flying around that any particle that tried to escape out of it was usually uh, collided with and deflected um, in a very similar way to how neutrinos and photons exit the sun. It usually takes them about a million years to get from the core to the outside of the sun and then only about eight minutes to reach the Earth. And that's because as they're moving, they're colliding with other things, being absorbed and emitted and absorbed and emitted as they have this very like bouncy, small, short walk to get out of that actual um, that core of a star. And a very similar thing would be happening in the early universe there. So for neutrinos on the edge that are formed and emitted, there's absolutely going to be some leakage somewhere, but the amount of it was contained within this, this shell of the early universe. So are you, are you suggesting then that the neutrino universe is actually bigger than the universe that we can see? It's, it's a complicated one to think of when you think of the size of the universe, because we don't know what the universe is expanding into. If there's an outer universe, for example, um, there's, there's, there's a lot still that we don't fully understand. Um, the visible universe itself is definitely much smaller than the actual universe. The universe that we can see um, is much smaller than the universe that we know exists out there, purely because we know that the universe was still expanding throughout this early period pre-recombination. So it was still growing for these 3, 370,000 years um, and still expanding during that time. But the light and the matter that is now the universe we see didn't break free of that until the point of recombination. Okay, just just one more, if I may. Absolutely. I, I think many years ago, I read a book by Kip Thorne, and he was discussing the fact that in the early universe where physics breaks down, it was actually dimensionless, so it could actually be huge. And I think Richard Feynman alluded to the fact where he said he thought there was plenty of space at the bottom, as he called it, in his <laughs> Brooklyn accent, no doubt. You know, I think I might have that book on my bookshelf. Just one moment. <laughs> Um, yes, I know the passage. I know the passage you mean. I have been. I was reading it a couple of days ago, um, and my answer to you there is again very similar to as what happened pre-universe. We can speculate on a lot, but a lot of what our theory is for that early, early universe section is taking what we know about physics today and then trying to extrapolate back and map that onto what the early universe might have been like. And this is one of the big causes of the um, debate between the physics of the early universe and the physics of the late universe. A very typical thing in that is that uh, some people believe that the amount of dark energy is constant throughout the universe, throughout time rather, um, but we're detecting two different amounts between today and in the past. So some people think it might be evolving um, and there's, there's a lot of debate going on. So until we know for sort of certain what's going on with physics itself and astronomy, sort of making accurate um, and reliable predictions about this super early universe uh, and the dimensions thereof or the space of it um, is mostly a thought experiment that keeps the theoretical physicists happy when we sort of leave them up in the attic from time to time. <laughs> but um, it's, it's an interesting thought for, for sure, but I'm not the authority on that area really to answer the question. Thank you. Okay, Lyra, I think we've worked you hard enough this evening. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so much for letting me come and talk to you all. Ladies and gentlemen, can we give Lyra Hawkins a big Mexican Switzerland Astronomical Society 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Clive. Thank you so much.